Thank you. What's going on, everybody? How's uh, Depth of Field going so far? Good? That, yeah, busy. Yeah, that's, uh, that comes with the territory when you come to an event like this. So first things first, I want to say uh, thank you to all of you for uh, packing it in this very small room. Uh, I'm going to do my best that uh, hopefully when you walk out of here, you'll be like, it was worth it to sit in this chair and uh, you know, be crammed up next to everyone. But how awesome is that? After, how, how, Michael, how long was it? Uh, three years, four years since the last step of the field? I mean, for us to be able to get together in this room in person, not virtual, but actually in person, you get to rub up against somebody, like that's, that's pretty awesome. So uh, big thanks to B&H for putting this together and for having me here, for bringing this like crazy lineup. What do you guys think about the lineup of photographers? It's crazy. I was looking at it, I'm like, it's literally a murderer's row of just amazing portrait photographers, and then there's me, right? So, um, so today, uh, b before I say that, big thanks to B&H, big thanks to Sony, because uh, without them, I would probably still be at home right now, uh, and I hear it's cold. So um, anyway, today we're going to be talking about portrait photography, and I'm going to distill this big topic, right? Um, how many of you... Uh, claim to be portrait photographers, that's your thing, okay? How many of you want to be portrait photographers? All right, how many of you just don't care about portrait photography? You're just here because it's B&H and it's a good deal, they got specials, all right, that's what I figured. So uh, I was very much like many of you, a little over a decade ago, uh, I wanted to become a better portrait photographer. My goal was, at the time, I wanted to parlay all of these skills that I learned in corporate America uh, through sales, through marketing. I knew that I liked people. I, I liked being around people, talking to people. I just didn't know what I wanted to do in terms of taking pictures, right? Um, so what I ended up doing, and I'm showing you all these photos, and of course you're gonna see a lot of hopefully good looking photos, and a lot of presenters are gonna do that. They're gonna show you these amazing, beautiful photos that they've taken throughout their career. I'm doing it opposite. These are the first two photographs that I took the day that I got my strobes at my house. How many of y'all have a home studio? All right, how many of you actually have like a studio studio, like separate from your house? Wow, you guys are very blessed. Uh, because when I started, my studio was my living room. And I literally, every photo shoot would have to disassemble my sectional and put it in another room, set up my backdrop, my lights, and uh, do a photo shoot. And then very quickly, clean up everything Right? And, and make it look like there was nothing there, you know, an hour or so later. Um, so these are friends of mine that I used to work with. Uh, I literally had just received three strobes, because I don't know about y'all, but uh, I used to watch YouTube. I used to watch uh, Creative Live back in the day. Um, and so I went out and I bought a bunch of strobes. And they showed up, and I'm eager, and I'm excited. I'm like, let's go. We're about to take some pictures. These are the first two photos. Uh, David was the first one, didn't even have the backdrop in the right spot, but I'm just looking at the light, and I'm looking at my magazine that I'm using as my reference, and then I take the picture of David, and I'm like, pretty close, right? <laughs> pretty close. So then my buddy Ian shows up, and I'm like, okay, I think I, you know, it's been an hour or so that I was shooting with David, so I'm like, I think I got this figured out. It's been an hour, right? So I get Ian in front, and I'm like, oh, now I nailed it. Totally nailed it, right? I wanted to take better portraits, but the reality was that there was a lot of information floating around. And unfortunately for me, or fortunately for me, uh, it took many years for me to figure out what is the reality, like what do I really need to know to take better portraits? Not seeing a bunch of photos and trying to reverse engineer, that's part of it, but what do I really need to take better portraits? And so over time, I was uh, very fortunate, and I'm gonna show you and, and tell you exactly how I did it. Uh, but these are some of the newer images. So I went from those two photos uh, to learning how to take photos in a studio, uh, learning how to manipulate and work with light outdoors, um, and just create you know, a lot of different types of imagery that uh, was marketable, something that would sell. And so uh, would you be interested in learning how to go from those first few photos to these? That's, that's the goal, right? So. How many months? How long in between? <laughs> how long in between that? So uh, that's a good question. So the question was, how long was it in between those first two photos and what you're seeing now? 
I would say it probably took me about a good year and a half to go from like I have no clue what I'm doing and I'm literally just pushing a button to having some sort of competency of how the flash works. And then it's another two or three years of learning how to work with people. And so I'm gonna talk about that because I think that's the missing link for a lot of people. We spend a lot of time on the technical, we spend a lot of time on the craft, uh, but not spending so much time on the uh, people side of things. And if we're gonna be portrait photographers, it is not acceptable and it's not gonna work out for you if you want to shrink behind your camera every time, right? It's not gonna work, it's not a good look. And fortunately, how many of y'all would consider yourselves to be an introvert like myself? All right, so it's very common for photographers to be introverts and many people take up photography and they just wanna hide behind the camera and that's okay for some. I would highly recommend to you and we'll talk about ways that uh, you can find another mode find another switch uh, in your personality that when you pick up your camera, that you can be more than what you are without the camera, right? So that's what we're gonna be talking about. You don't get better by doing something less. And this is something that, uh, you know, going with the question that you asked, the way that I was able to become a better portrait photographer was really, as I look back, it kind of broke down to five different steps that I took. And there's obviously little, you know, sub points to it, and I'm gonna go through them today. But really, the majority of what I wanna make sure that you walk away with is you don't get better by doing something less, right? Um, unless it's drugs, you probably would get better if you do less or drink alcohol. I didn't think this through, apparently. But when it comes to photography specifically, you don't get better by taking less pictures. You have to take more. Not only do you have to take more, but you have to do more with different people, right? Different kinds of people, different ages, different heights, different skin tones, different backgrounds, different humor levels, right? Um, we, we have to practice a lot, and the more that we practice, the better that we're gonna get. So my biggest takeaway that I wanna make sure that you walk away with, especially after this crazy lineup at uh, Depth of Field, is that you take some of these things and you start using them right away, because it will help you. But I have a five-step method. Uh, I'm not marketing anything to you. There's no like, you know, you need to buy something at the end of this. Um, all of this information and the things I'm gonna teach you are free and I believe that uh, they're things that you'll be able to hopefully implement and improve your work. So let's get into the first one, which is you have to train your eye. Uh, how many people, and this is gonna be tough, uh, how many of you watch anime? Any anime, what? Wow, okay, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so, um, so anybody watch Naruto? There's a few. All right, so um, y'all might get the reference with training your eye, your, your Sharingan, right? Um, so the idea is that you have to train your eye to what good portrait photography looks like, right? You have to be able to look at a good portrait and you have to figure out why is it a good portrait, right? It's not enough, and I actually learned this uh, strangely enough, I didn't take uh, I didn't go to college for photography or anything like that, but I did take a humanities class, and that humanities teacher was awesome. Uh, and he basically told me on day one, listen, you're gonna see a lot of art in this book. There's gonna be things that you like and things that you don't like. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It matters that you can look at it and say why you do or do not like it. And so with portrait photography, it's very much the same. You have to train your eye. Why is it good? Why is it not good? Right? There's a lot of value in looking at a portrait and knowing why it isn't good, sometimes more so than knowing what, why it's good. Right? So there's ways to be able to do this, and these are just some of the ways. These are the ways that I um, tend to find that pushes the ball pretty far in this process, which is that, God bless you, um, study the images of the greats. Uh, we have a lot of great presenters, speakers that are here today uh, that have decades and decades of experience taking portraits. Um, there are many great photographers that you probably haven't even heard of, that they don't even teach. They're not in that circuit, right? But they are amazing portrait photographers. And I would tell you, look at the greats, the Annie Leibovitz of the world, um, you know, the Richard Avedons of the world, the uh, Patrick Demarchelier, the Marco Grobs, um, Michael Muller, like look at these great portrait photographers from back in the day and from today, and look at their images and start to look at what makes this image cool. Why is it good, right? Is it the lighting? 
Is it, uh, obviously, like, they're photo a lot of these people are photographing famous people, and sometimes we give people a pass, because it's like, oh, well, they're famous. Of course they're going to look good, right? Um, but the reality is that if the lighting is really good, the location, whatever it might be, all those elements are really good, uh, then you can apply those things to your portraits and make any normal person look pretty awesome, too. So study those images, look at them. Uh, I usually take post-it notes, and I have books that photographers have written, uh, and I get post-it notes, and I start writing down, like, what is it that's good about this photo that I like? Uh, what would maybe I would change about this photograph? And I would just write it down on the post-it, and I would stick it to the photo. And that way, when I look at the photo, constantly reminded. You know, we have a great author, actually. Neil uh, has an awesome book, and I'm only saying it because he's, he's here. Um, but Neil has a great uh, book on photography as well. I'll have his book, I look through his photos, and I start putting post-it notes. What do I like? What would I personally change, um, if anything at all? And I try to apply it in my next photo shoot. Very, very simple, very easy uh, concept. Yes? Who do you consider the greats? The greats? Um, those photographers that I named. Um, the, uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Marco Grob is one of my personal favorites. Dan Winters is amazing. Uh, Martin Scholler is amazing. Um, yeah, I could, I could do a whole blog post on great, great photographers. A lot of the photographers that we have here um, that are doing the keynotes, great portrait photographers, uh, look at those. And the big thing that I'm trying to get across is like, there's value in looking at your peers and looking at the work that they produce. And I think that's what a lot of photographers do starting out. They find, you know, say I'm in Orlando right now, I'll find the people in Orlando that I think are good and I look at their photos and I put them up on a pedestal because they're my competition, if you want to call it that. But the reality is that's not the threshold for me. The threshold are the all-time greats, right? And if I can get to that level, I'm pretty sure the local level is going to be okay. Like, I, I, I'll be all right, you know? So that's kind of the big idea. Um, you want to Monday morning quarterback your images, okay? And all that means is that every photo shoot that you do, I, and I can't stress this enough, there's a lot of photographers that uh, are one extreme or the other. Some photographers are like, you know, uh, every photo I take is, is, is fire, it's just amazing. I can't take a bad frame, right? And if that's you, uh, that's awesome, right? That's cool. Uh, but there's also the opposite, which is crazy to me, which is like every photo they take, they're like, ah, oh, this wasn't good. Oh, I don't like this photo. I would have done this. I would have done that. I would have done the other. And then they show me the photo after giving me this long spiel. And I'm like, this is a great photo. What are you talking about? Right? So very important that we ourselves, Monday morning quarterback, we look at our images and we're doing that little exercise of writing it down. What would I have done differently? Right? And then guess what? You set up another photo shoot and you do differently. It's not that hard, right? When I'm telling you that I changed a, a, a good portion of the quality of my work in a year and a half, it's because every single week for that period of time, I would have anywhere from three to five, six different people that would come through my studio. I'm using air quotes for that because it's my <laughs> living room. Uh, but uh, they would come through the studio and I would photograph them and I would look at those photos. And I would look at the best ones that I took. And I said, OK, how could I do this better? What was good so that I keep doing it? But what could I do better next time? You have to quarterback your own images. You have to look at them and break them down. There shouldn't be someone that comes to you and tells you, hey, for example, uh, when I did my first set of photos with Ian, I thought they were great. And then I posted them up. And people were like, hey, every single shot is out of focus. And I'm like, no, you're kidding me. These are sharp. What are you talking about? Dude is buff. You can see all the lines in his uh, abs and all that, and they're like, yeah, but the eyes are soft. And I'm like, nah, you don't know what you're talking about. I get in the computer, I zoom in. Oh, you were right. Shoot, okay, well, guess what? Next time around, I'm more focused on that. Back then, I was shooting DSLR. Uh, nowadays, I shoot mirrorless. I don't have that problem anymore. Now the camera does that for me, which opens up a whole new world of creativity where I don't have to worry about, are the eyes sharp, are they in focus? The next thing is, um, and I put an asterisk next to this because you have to be very careful with this, but uh, you should look to get professional critiques for your portrait work. It's very valuable. For me, I had a circle of friends who were portrait photographers, working uh, pros, who would look at my images and 
they would pat me on the back sometimes and say, great job. And other times they'd say, Miguel, what in the world were you thinking? And so, you know, uh, having that circle really helped because we sharpen one another. And uh, if you don't have that, get that. Develop it. We're, many of us are uh, in New York. We're in the New York area, New Jersey. There's a lot of talent here. You should have a circle of people that you know that you can sharpen one another and get better at shooting portraits. Um, but be very careful who you get your critiques from because there are some people, for example, I had a um, person who I will leave nameless, uh, amazing, amazing photographer uh, who I look up to, and I showed them my photos, and um, they told me in very, uh, un actually very clear words that I didn't know blank about photography, and it was a very colorful word um, that might be brown. And so <laughs> I was like, really? Man, that's harsh, you know, and it kind of hurt me, but I'm like, okay, I want to listen because obviously this person knows something that I don't. Tell me, what is it? And they went through the list, this, this, and this, and I'm like, my eyes opened up. My eyes have, now I've, I've absorbed that information and now I'm using that in every single portrait session from here on out. Right? So you have to get these professional critiques, but just be careful where you get them from and also be ready because when you get them, not everybody's going to be giving you a pat on the back, you know? Uh, and I'm happy to say, like, I mean, for me to get that kind of critique to my face and we didn't get into a fight about it, <laughs> that's, you know, you, you'll be okay. So that's how you do it. That's how you train your eye. Um, there's obviously many other ways, but I would tell you that if you do these three things, you're going to see a major improvement in your standard of what a good portrait is. Um, I, I forgot what they call them. Um, the people that drink wine, that taste wine, and they could taste all the stuff in the wine? Sommelier. Sommelier, yeah. You need to be that, but for portrait photography, right? You need to be able to look at a portrait, and when you say that it's a good portrait, you know why it's a good portrait. And I can't tell you that. I can't do that for you. I can't beat your eyes. You have to train your own eyes to be able to do that. And the good news is if you do this, very simple to do. Step number two is to be the SME. Uh, anybody know what a SME is? Subject matter expert, all right? I had to look it up on Indeed.com because I feel like it explains, like subject matter expert sounds pretty, you know. But uh, it's a uh, authority on a specific area, practice, process, technical method, or piece of equipment. How many of you, being honest, would consider yourself to be a SME when it comes to portrait photography? Every single hand should go up. Because here's the deal. If I gave my mom a camera, and I gave y'all a camera, who would be the subject matter expert if my mom is 80 years old and doesn't know how to operate a remote control? You're the subject matter expert when it comes to photography in that. And when you're working with clients and you're working with people, you are the subject matter expert when it comes to photography. But many of us don't live up to that moniker because we have imposter syndrome. We have all these mental, emotional hurdles that keep us from being that person that we need to be to get better portraits, right? So how do you become the subject matter expert when it comes to portraits, right? Very simple. To me, you need to be decisive. Have you ever seen a great leader that is not decisive? I, I, I couldn't think of any. I don't know that they exist. Uh, great leaders are decisive. I think great portrait photographers are decisive. Now, I'm not saying that great portrait photographers don't mess up or that they don't have concepts or ideas that just go right? That happens all the time, but you have to be decisive. You have to say, okay, for example, the way this looks, if you're working with somebody and you're trying to figure out a concept, you're trying to figure out how you want them to pose, what you don't want to do is to say, hmm, I guess, uh, what's your name? Chris. Chris, do me a favor, um, I guess, Turn your shoulder like that. Mm, no. How about like that? Then uh, let's, right? That doesn't work. Because if you do that, and you may not do it like exactly the way I'm doing it, I'm making it really crazy, but you might do some version of that. And if you do that, the person that's in front of you is going to be like, does this person know what the heck they're doing? Do they know what time it is? Do they know what day it is? Like, they're not going to roll with you because they feel like you don't know what you're doing, right? So you have to be decisive. What you're gonna end up doing, and 
this is something that took me a long time to figure out, and I've had to practice this, which is why I'm telling you, the more you practice, the better you get. I got very good at just coming up with an idea and selling it like it's the best thing since sliced bread. And it might not be a good idea. I might take that first photo and internally be like, oh my gosh, I need a new hobby, right? <laughs> but sometimes I do it and I'm like, man, that was great, right? And then they're like, oh my gosh, every single photo, even the bad ones, they're like, this was great. I love these photos. And I'm like, thank you. Uh, this is what I do, right? <laughs> so, um, so you need to be decisive. If you're not decisive, you're going to notice that even when you take that really good picture, when that person looks at that photo, if it's a client, friend, whatever, they're not going to feel the same about the photo if you're just like, meh, yeah, there you go, right? Be decisive about everything that you're doing. As you're moving your lights, as you are choosing your, your lens and your camera accessories and you're attaching you know, that stuff to your camera, you have to be decisive, right? It can't be like I'm standing there at my, my lens rack, as everyone has. Y'all got a lens rack, right? Where you got like 50 lenses. Uh, I don't have that either. But um, <laughs> yeah, I got like three lenses, but I keep them clean. You know? So I'm, I'm standing there like, hmm, which, which one do I pick? I'm not going to do that because they're going to look at me and be like, pick one, bro. Like, just let's go, right? So what do I do? Hey, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to have you stand here, and I just grab a lens, and let's go. And I start shooting, and I'm looking at the photo. And if it's not what I need, you know what? Hang on. I'm going to change something up here real quick. Bing, bing, bing. All right. Cool. Here we go. Click, 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 right? Be decisive, even about those little things, because I'm telling you, people are watching you. And if you look like you don't know what you're doing, their expressions, their poses, they're not going to give you their best. God forbid you're working with somebody who's like a, a CEO of a company or uh, somebody famous that works with a lot of photographers. If they see you farting around with your stuff, it ain't going to look good, right? So you have to make sure that you're decisive. The next thing is that you got to communicate and you need to affirm. I know that many of us are introverts. It could be very hard for us to... Um, express ourselves, which is why we take up portrait photography sometimes. Um, but I'm telling you, when you pick up your camera, you must find there's a, a hidden switch. You could set it to a custom feature on your, your camera, which is this like brave switch, we're going to call it. And so you, when, you, when you're starting your photo shoot, you push that brave switch. And who you are as an introvert, it's off. You just turned it off when you push that button. Now you are that person that communicates what you want, you're saying it decisively, you're affirming that person and letting them know they're doing a good job. And I'm gonna tell you all a secret, you're telling them that even if they're not doing a good job, right? Even if that person is not killing it in front of the camera, you still have to give them that like enthusiasm. This is great, I love this. You're doing an awesome job right now. Keep shooting. Because as you continue to shoot, they're going to liven up, they're gonna wake up, and you're going to get better photos out of them. But you have to communicate what you want, and you have to affirm them. Now, how many of you struggle with posing? It's like the most common thing, right? I'm going to tell you all a secret. Two secrets. Secret number one is that not every pose works for everyone. So for me to teach you a bunch of poses, you, it might work for two or three people, and then you get someone else in front of you with a different body type, and it ain't going to work. And they're going to be like, oh, man, I don't know what to do. Right? The secret to taking a good photo and having a good pose, make it up. Every single time, make it up. Because every body is different, every body shape is different, body type, everything is completely different. Make it up. But when you make it up, be decisive about it. Make it like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I just put you, like, they need to carve you into a statue that this pose is so amazing. <laughs> right? And then you start taking those photos, and guess what? They're standing a little bit taller, right? They're a little bit more. I don't have hair, but you can pretend, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, you're affirming them. You're making them feel good, and they're going to translate into better photos when you do that. The other thing, too, is to be endlessly curious about your craft. Um, I don't want to say that I obsessed over portrait photography in that year and a half that I, you know, went from those first two photos to what I do now. Um, but I would say I was very curious about photography. That led me to read books. That led me to come to events like Depth of Field. That led me to go to workshops like the one that Joe is putting on, right? I would go to workshops. I would go to other friends 
who are photographers and I would hang out for their shoots and I would carry their lights or carry their bags and I'm, you know, fly on the wall watching their photo shoot and thinking, oh my gosh, what are they doing, right? And sometimes I'm like, wow, that's really cool. I'm going to write that down, right? So be curious about photography and let that curiosity fuel you to learn new things. We live in like the best times ever because when I started in portrait photography, there were very few places you could go to learn. You got to go to school for it maybe assist a, a jerk photographer that's gonna make you carry like 500 pounds of gear, you know, up like 10 flights of steps or more, right? Um, you can learn for free today, just like we're doing now. So utilize those resources, be curious about your craft, it will help you tremendously. Step number three, develop your other half, right? And this is something I struggled a lot with because I came from a very technical background, meaning like I love computers. I used to, I still do build my own computers. Um, but any gamers here? Any video game players? There's a few. Um, so back in the day, um, I used to love playing fighting games, playing Street Fighter, and uh, I couldn't find a joystick like what I had in the arcade. So what did I do? I found out where they get their buttons and the joysticks from, distributor. I bought them. I went to Home Depot. I bought some wood. Uh, I took a, a controller and I opened it up and I soldered the buttons to the, the control pad, put it inside of this very janky looking wood box, and boom, I got an arcade stick. So, you know, these are things, like I'm a very technically minded person. So for me, I knew like my kind of like gap in this is I'm not super artistic, right? I'm, I'm not somebody who, I don't sing, I don't dance, I don't, you know, play music or anything like that. Like my craft is this and it's learned 1000%. So for, for those of you that are here, how many of you and in the chat as well, uh, what would you identify? Any technical photographers here? Okay, like you're, and when I say technical, I'm saying you're more into like the settings, where the light is coming from, you know, all the elements in the recipe of a photo versus the art. How many artists do we have in the chat and in the room? All right, so many photographers fall into that artistic camp where, you know what, your photos technically might not be there, but the, the art of it, the soul, the feeling, right? That's what it's all about with your portraits. And I would tell you that if you wanna become a great photographer, a great portrait photographer, you need to nurture your other half, right? So if you're like me and you're that technical photographer, you gotta start developing that artistic side because there are gonna be certain projects where your artistic side is gonna to need to be sharpened and need to be cultivated. I'll give you an example. I'm a very um, technical photographer, but uh, I had this artistic opportunity. My makeup artist says, hey, I wanna create a very specific kind of image. And uh, I wanna, I have this mixture uh, that looks like gold and I wanna pour it on the model's face and do like a really cool photo with gold dripping down her face. And I'm like, okay, so from an artistic perspective, I get it. I saw that picture in my head, model posing, head back, gold dripping on her face, right? So I get the art very easy. From a technical side, it's actually really hard to do. Because if you think about it, once she pours this liquid on the person's face, it's game over. There's no like, oh, I didn't get it, let's do that again, right? You can do that, but eh, it's, you know, her makeup's gonna be all messed up and you're gonna know that it already happened. So from a technical perspective, what did I do? It is a very um, time-honored uh, technique that's called spray and pray. I don't know if you all have heard of this technique. Um, you know, it's been talked about in some circles that it is not the most professional thing to do, uh, but uh, I'm gonna admit it, I, I sprayed and prayed. Um, so this was uh, 36 images that were taken. This was using the uh, Sony Alpha 7 Mark III using a 90 uh, macro because I wanted to get a lot of detail in the face. And she was standing, as you could see, uh, actually you can't see it because it's cropped a little bit, but makeup artist was actually standing on a little step stool and she was just waiting. And I was like, okay, on your mark, get set, go. And she starts pouring the liquid and uh, I was using, I believe these were Profoto D2s um, and I'm shooting at high frame rate on my Sony a7 III and I'm just brrrr, just letting it rip as this liquid is just going across her face. So we took 36 images. Out of those 36, that was the frame. That was the moment. 
Could I have timed that? I don't know, maybe. But do you want to take that chance, right? If you're an artistic photographer, you might have taken one of the other 36 images, and you would have been fine with it. Maybe, I don't know. But for me, the technical side is what helped me to make sure that I got that shot, that I could deliver that artistic outlook that she had, that I could do it technically. So very important, how do you do this? First off, you need to know what kind of photographer you are. Many of you have already said, I'm a technical photographer, I'm an artistic one. You already know. Uh, but identify which is your stronger half, right? And start to work on the elements that make you stronger on the other side. You want to break down a concept or an idea into art and technical. So when she told me this artistic idea that she had, which seems very simple, I had to think from a technical perspective, how do I pull that off, right? You could try to time it, but if you miss, you're going to look kind of funny. You're not going to look like you know what you're doing. So you want to make sure that you can pull that off. Um, from an artistic perspective, when she told me that, I had to really think about it, right? Because it's not my, my normal mode. So work on that. Break down a concept. What is the art side of this photo? What is the technical side of this photo? Write those things down. Execute on those things. And again, pr practice, rinse, and repeat. Anytime anybody asks me for advice, how do I become a better portrait photographer? Do as many photo shoots as you can. Practice, rinse, and repeat. Do it again, right? And continue to do it so that you can figure out what made you good and where you can improve. Next thing, develop characters. Uh, I can't stress how important this is. For many people um, who are having their picture taken, they are themselves. And they often don't give you their true self when you go to take their photos. Most of the time, they're worried about how they look, how old they are, how many wrinkles, how many gray hairs. Y'all have heard this, right? Like, we get this all the time. So it's very important that we help them by developing a character that they can play into. Even at, no matter what age. This works really good when they're really young and they're kids. But it works really good for old folks, too, right? For mature folks, as I would like to say. So get people to play characters. This example here, uh, my makeup artist, this was very simple. She came in with these rings that she got off of Amazon. And she's like, I don't know, I just got these. It was recommended. And I was like, hey, can you do something with this? And I was like, I guess, right? So um, she puts them on. And what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Like, uh, when you see these photos, what um, character kingdom would you think of? Wakanda, right? All right, so I know I'm not crazy. So as soon as I saw that, I'm like, Wakanda forever, right? This is going to be great. So I told her, I want you to play this very powerful um, you know, character from Wakanda. And I made up this whole silly scenario, right? And I make them up on the spot. I need you to play into this character, right? And as I'm taking the photos, I'm encouraging them. I'm telling them, like, Wakanda forever, right? You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm trying to get them to play into the character because that's going to bring the expressions and the poses and the vibe that I'm not going to get if I just say, OK, are we ready? Are we ready to have your picture? OK. <laughs> right? And I'm saying that, but I'm not going to lie. I've, I've, I've watched a lot of photographers work. Um, so that's the big thing. Get them to play characters. It's going to be fun. Uh, same thing here. You know, it's very easy when you have two people and they're not boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever, uh, to try to get them to play some sort of fake intimacy, right? And so, um, you know, I, I create characters and I create scenarios and I tell them, listen, so uh, first person, I want you to look at the camera and I want you to actually, no, let's start on this side because it will make more sense. For the gentleman in the photo, listen, I want you to, uh, you to think to yourself, you are intoxicated with this woman, right? She is somebody that you have loved and wanted to be with for your entire life. And uh, so you love her so much that you just love the smell of her hair. Like, everything about her is just intoxicating. For the female model, I'm like, listen, here's what I want you to do. You're oblivious to all of this. You don't know, like you're just like, oh, who me? I'm beautiful, right? That's the vibe, and I'm, I'm creating these characters in the story, and they're cracking up, and guess what? They get there, and I start taking their photo, and do you see the character in the photo? 
right? If I could have told them, hey, just go up to her and just smell her hair, it'd be creepy. It'd be creepy. I'm not going to lie. The characters are important. You have to make up the characters, you know? Um, this was another one. You know, we were trying to go for a detective, a private eye. He came in with this jacket. He came in with this hat. It looked really cool. So I told him, I'm like, you know, you're Dick Tracy. You know, we're, we're trying to go for this um, kind of um, mysterious type of vibe. You're on the case. And I make up a whole story. And then he plays into that role and plays into that character. It's very important. Create a character. Number five, select your optics. This is something that uh, I, I see a lot of photographers when they're starting out, they struggle to figure out what kind of lenses do I use, what's good, what's bad. Um, it's very important that you choose your optics wisely. Uh, number one, they cost a lot. Uh, number two, like most of the time you kind of like date your camera bodies and you marry your lenses. So it's really important that you pick a really good lens that you know is gonna take care of you for years to come. Uh, so I'll give you some examples. This was one I took a while back with the 100 um, millimeter 2.8 G Master. And uh, I cut into this photo more than 400%, but the reason for it is I want you to see the detail, right? Being able to capture the details that you wanna capture, uh, it's one of the most beautiful things about portrait photography today versus like uh, using older cameras, film cameras and things like that. Uh, when these lenses hit, they hit, right? And you get crazy amounts of detail, lots of sharpness. Um, there's gonna be times where you don't want that, and that's fine too. You could shoot these on the other end, shoot them wide open, blur the skin. It looks better than it's ever looked in all of photography, but this is a type of photography that you don't see very much, and it separates your portraits from the competition when people can look at your photos and be like, damn, that's a lot of detail, right? This is with the uh, 70 to 200. And I would say if you're a portrait photographer and maybe somebody will ask this question, like what's your favorite lens? Um, I have a lot of favorites, but the 70 to 200, if I can only have one, I could probably do like 99.9% .9 of what I do with that one lens. So whatever system it is that you're using, uh, 70 to 200 would be your, your bread and butter. Um, I personally, this was taken with version one. The new version two of this lens is really light. Um, it's, it's amazing, and it's even sharper than this. So had I taken the same photo with version two, I would imagine it would look even better, which is bizarre for me to think. Um, same thing here, I'm outdoors. Um, this photograph, I was actually dropping the model off at the train station, because I had my studio in New Jersey at the time. And, uh, and I was like, wow, you know, this location's got some crazy light. I pulled over on the side of the road, got my camera out, and that picture literally was on the side of the road while we were on our way to the train station. Just crazy light. Uh, and there's something that I love to do in my photos. Uh, I get people that ask me all the time about watermarking images. And uh, when you shoot with a really good lens, you don't need to watermark them uh, because that is me in the catch lights of the eyes. So uh, that's the whole photo there on the left. And then uh, that's, that's me. So yes. Yeah, that is all natural light, uh, plus a reflector. So you can actually see the reflector. It's like a triangular shaped reflector. So I did one of these old pro uh, things, which was uh, holding the reflector with one hand, just like that. That's me in the catch lights, literally, is just holding the reflector and taking the photo. And I would say we probably took six or seven photos because the train was coming. And I'm that guy who's like, I gotta pull over and take this photo, I'm sorry. If you're late, I'll, I'll, you know, you can catch the next train or I'll just have to take you. Um, but yeah, um, these, these lenses nowadays, they resolve amazingly. And I would tell you that uh, this is a very important thing for you to do for your portrait work as well. If you take a portrait like this and you look at it on the back of your camera and you think that you got the shot, do me a favor and do a quality check. My quality checks are very simple. I start zooming into the photo, I specifically zoom in on the eye, and I wanna make sure that I see detail in the eyes. Had I done that on that first photo that I took when I first was shooting strobe, I would've known in two seconds, holy cow, it looks like I got beer goggles on, right? Because it was blurry, I couldn't really see the details in his face. But if you actually have a decent camera, decent optics, you take that photo, you zoom in, and it looks good, keep on rolling. Pose them differently, find different light, find different expressions. Yes? Right, here we go. Can you, can you, what, what's that shot at? 
Uh, that's shot wide open at f1.8. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's what the 85 1.8 from Sony and uh, just shot wide open. Yes. Oh, what lens? Yep, Sony 85 1.8. 85 prime. 85 prime, yep. And so you'll notice actually across these three photographs, that was 85. Uh, this was with the 70 to 200, and this was with the 100. Um, this was 85, no, sorry, that was 85. This was 85 G Master. That was likely 85 1.8. Um, I don't remember. Uh, this one might be, this one might be 70 to 200. Um, a majority of the photographs that I take are taken with that like 85 to like 135 range. Um, and that's why the 70 to 200 is great because you have all of those focal lengths. And if you get one that's really sharp, then your pictures are doing pretty good. So, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, so that's a good question. So she was asking, for this photograph, if I'm taking this photo, uh, and I have a reflector in one hand at f1.8 and my camera in the other, how did I stay so steady to get the eyes in focus? Um, I would love to take credit for this. I really would, um, but it's the camera. Autofocus, the way that I do it is I shoot wide area, uh, continuous autofocus using eye autofocus. And so what will happen is as the person is moving around, you'll see that the box stays on the eye and it tracks them. They can spin around, they can do whatever. The camera will pick the closest eye to the camera and it keeps them in focus. Then it's up to me to make sure that I'm cropping the image the way it needs to be cropped, that I'm looking at the light, that I'm looking for weird things that are gonna cause issues and retouching later on, straight hairs, things like that. Um, that's what's really awesome about using modern cameras today. You don't have to worry about that. Like, I could literally do this, do this, and do this, right? Ah, right? I could do all of that, and I don't have to worry. It's going to be sharp every time. Hand, doesn't matter. Even if the hand was shaking, it still would have been sharp. So that's, that's the key. The camera is doing a lot of that. Um, having the high enough shutter speed as well is going to help that. I think this one I want to say was somewhere around 800 to 1,000. Yeah. Got a question in the back? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good question. So the question is, if I'm going to shoot at f1.8, uh, how worried am, am I about both eyes being in focus? It's going to depend on what we're going for with the shot. So I already know right away, if I'm shooting anything under, let's say, f5.6, I'm going to tell the person that I'm photographing that I want their face to either look directly at the camera, they could do this, they could do this, right? Because the focus, it's gonna pick an eye. So long as the eyes are parallel to one another, they could do this and both eyes will be in focus. The problem is when they do this or they do this because now the eyes are off axis, it's only gonna pick one. One will be sharp, the other one won't be. Um, so you gotta make sure that you're shooting with the right depth of field. And if you're shooting at F1.8, 1.4, 1.2, I'm telling the person, just like I told her, you notice she's looking directly at the camera. Had she done this, game over, right? Her face would have been blurry. I wouldn't have had the texture and the detail on the face, um, which it looks different. I don't know how it's looking online. Um, on the TV, the TV displays this a lot brighter. Um, you're welcome to come and see it on this laptop after. But uh, you'll see that like, you can see all the detail in the skin. And part of that is because I'm using the depth of field, shooting it wide open, but I also have their face straight on. So when it catches the eye, we have a pretty good amount of depth of field and we have good focus and sharp details. So what other questions do we have? The back, yes. Good, good to see you. Okay. Yeah. So the question is in regards to distance uh, between yourself and the person that you're photographing. Um, the answer is not going to be the fun one because it's basically that it varies depending on which lens I'm using. So in this case with the 85, I mean, I was close enough to where 
this reflector, I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell, but like there was probably maybe six to eight inches away from her stomach. The reflector was maybe about two feet. So I was relatively close. I was probably at whatever the minimum focus distance is of that 85. I'm like right there. Uh, but that was to catch like a nice tight headshot. Um, I tend to like to shoot, as you can see throughout the majority of my images, I have, I like to shoot tight. And um, so I get as tight as I need to get, like as close as I need to get, to be able to compose the image to where in camera, it looks the way I want it to look. So oftentimes what's really good is like, um, you can get a 70 to 200, you could use that, and in that case, you could be a little bit farther back uh, to get those types of shots, but yeah, I'm as close as I need to be, and as close as I can get with some of these lenses. Um, and I also feel it out, you know, there's some people that like, they need their personal space, you know what I mean? So uh, in that type of situation, you break out the 70 to 200, and maybe I'm at 150, 170, and we're, you know, yay far away, right? But the majority of the time, I will have like a table in front of me, and I'll have the reflector, and I'm probably about this far. I'm, what, like, put your arm out? Let's see, we're about two arms lengths away. This is about how far we are. He's, we're four feet, yeah. About four feet away, and we're here, boom, boom, boom. Sometimes, if I don't have my 70 to 200, and I wanna shoot that type of tight headshot, I'm like right here, right? And I got the light just outside of the frame. But it always depends, always depends. Yes. Yeah. So that's another thing, too. And that comes into the uh, portrait psychology side of things. I would tell you that a um, couple things. Number one, before you do a photo shoot, take a shower. <laughs> Please, take a shower. Brush your teeth. Um, bring some gum. Bring some gum. Listen, uh, I, I, I'm sure if I dig in my pocket, I got a couple sticks of gum, right? Uh, make sure your, your clothes, you know, you didn't leave them in the wash a little bit too long the night before, right? Because I'm telling you, all the skills that I just talked to you about, you're like, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. And then you left your shirt in the wash a little bit too long the night before, and then you dry it. Y'all have had this happen, right? Am I the only one? You know? And then you, you put on the shirt, and you're like, Nobody can smell that. You'll be fine. And then guess what? You go to do your photo shoot, and guess what? They're, they're like, dang, man, this person smells like they rolled on hot garbage, right? So make sure these are all little tiny things, and it seems crazy, but I'm telling you, somebody, I'm not going to lie, maybe I've done it. I don't know. It's possible. Um, but those are things that you have to look out for. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, get as close as you need to get. So. Yes, let's do a little round of applause for Miguel, everybody. Thank you.